Welcome. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? All right, all right. Let's go. We're in the middle of a series called Kaleo. Kaleo is a series that is based on the fact that we are called, yes, and um, there is a certain aspect of calling, and this is our third iteration of this series. It builds upon itself, right? This is something that builds on each other. So, so the first one we talked about, um, we talked about how the calling, the gospel is not a calling to a nine to five job, right? A lot of times we think that only pastors are called, and therefore that becomes a little tricky because then what do you do with nurses? And we're like, well, nurses and teachers are called, but engineers are not, and that's not true. Everybody is called. We're all called to live within the reality of the gospel so that no matter where you are and no matter what your circumstances are, you are always living within this and proclaiming it. Does that make sense? Right? So it's not just tied to your nine to five. Sometimes you have the privilege of living your nine to five within gospel, but a lot of times it's you. It's your life. God called you with your likes, with your preferences, with your foibles even. And it's okay. Because that's how we live our life. Now, based on that, we talked about like, what this calling of the gospel is. And, and last week, we, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we actually uh, saw that this implies this relational reality, uh, relational reality to, uh, man, you threw me off. <laughs> Hi, Macy. Relational reality to, in which God brought uh, Israel out of Egypt. Right? Remember we talked about that? We said like, well, okay, where, what was Israel? Israel's God's son. And where was God taking Israel? Well, Israel was being taken to Canaan. No, Israel was being taken to a relational reality, not a geographical setting. And that is the same thing that happens to us, that at the resurrection of Christ, there is a relational reality, a brand new reality that has been inaugurated and rests upon the resurrection of Christ which is why you and I now look at the gospel in a different way. It is not a theological concept, but it is a relational reality you and I live in. It is not just one of the many items and truths to talk about. It is the truth. I sustain that, and I humbly present that to you, that it is the truth that sustains all the others. So today I'd like for you to meet Gary. Who's Gary? Well, Gary is somebody that I'd like to sort of present as a figure, and then we're going to tie him up. Gary. I'm not endorsing any particular or specific TV show with this for those of you who are a little concerned at the illustration. I'm just using it as an icon because I figured why not use Gary? So Gary, there's four things. Gary has a worldview, guys, right? There's a worldview that Gary has. He's a family man. He's got a couple of kids, pays his taxes on time. He's the kind of person you want around in your neighborhood probably, you know? He's a good neighbor, probably not next door neighbor, might be a little too snoopy, right? But he's the type of neighbor that you want around in your neighborhood. Good person. Great guy. Now, Gary has four principles that he bases his worldview upon. And I'd like to share those principles with you this morning. Principle number one. All right, principle number one is that Gary loves the Holy Scriptures. Right? This is the first thing. Gary loves the Holy Scriptures. It is the Word of God. It must be protected and preserved. Obviously, Gary is not alone. Gary has a community of faith that he belongs to, right? He belongs to a community of faith. Of course, he's a good person. Loves the Holy Scriptures. It's the Word of God. It's revealed. And and as good as the Word of God is, as good as it is God's revelation to us, well, there are some practical things that we might run into, Right? Like, what do we do when a passage is hard to explain? Ah, glad you asked. Gary has a long standing, this community of faith has a long standing, unwritten, and mostly written tradition of wisdom that will tell you the true and accurate meaning of a text. So, if a text is too difficult to understand, you will go to said written tradition, right? And it will tell you, well, this is the meaning of the text. Because the text has to be understood correctly, right? Because it's the Word of God. It's an authoritative source, right? And Gary will look at the Word of God through the lens of this interpretative tradition because he loves the Word of God. The second thing that is important to Gary is that he understands and is dedicated to God's law. Gary understands and is that he loves the law. Right? It is the supreme guide to life. It must be meditated, prayed upon, studied, and obeyed. 
The law of God. Key. You guys following so far? The two things. Word of God, law. And of course, auxiliary precepts in order to in order to prevent Gary's community from breaking the law, there are some added laws and rules that need to be observed in order to preserve the law. You follow so far? For example, it's kind of like a fence of protection around the law, right? For example, the law says, remember the Sabbath, right? So Gary is wondering, well, what does that mean? It's too, too, it's too broad of a statement. Well, well, keep it holy. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that you can't work. Well, what does that mean? And so there's... There's fences around the principle, around that law, in order so that, th- that you don't break the law, right? There's principles, like how deep you should go into the water on the seventh day. Should it be your knees or should it be your thighs or your ankles? We don't know. You follow, right? It's because we need to protect the Sabbath. Because we love the law. That's Gary's community. How, mu- how much can you carry on the Sabbath? How, what, like, what's the weight? You know? Can you turn your car on? Can you, can you do what? Like, what do you do? How many steps? Is it a thousand or a thousand and one? Well, if it's a thousand, a thousand and one, like you get Gary. Gary's a guy who loves the law and who loves the Bible. He's got rules around it to avoid breaking the law. Third thing, Gary is missional. I mean, you tell Gary, let's go on a mission trip, Gary's going to go with you. You tell Gary, hey, we need somebody to learn the law and the word of God, Gary's on it. He is going to, he will go through sky, he will go across the ocean and across continents just to make a new convert. That's what Gary will do. And the reason why Gary is doing this is because Gary believes that they need to build up a faithful, true, committed, unique people that is different from the world. We could probably call them a peculiar people, right? So he's incredibly missional, loves the word of God. Loves the law of God. Very missional person. And the fourth one is that he believes in the coming of Messiah. His great hope, that's why the third one is tied to this one. The great hope of Gary is that Messiah will come soon. The kingdom of Messiah will be established. And Gary actually believes, get this, that by his doing or undoing, he can hasten the coming of Messiah by the obedience of the law. In fact, if he would have certain characteristics, it's almost like when Messiah sees that in Gary's community there are certain characteristics ready and manifested, then he will come. Right? So you follow so far, this is Gary, right? This is really cool. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with these. Word of God, law, evangelism, coming of Messiah. Unless you think that we're talking about a specific community of faith that we might belong to, I'm talking about the Pharisees. Because that's what the Pharisees believed. And we could call Gary Shmuel, but we'll just keep on calling him Gary for now. All right? If Israel, this is what Pharisees believed, right? At the time of Jesus, there's four groups trying to vie for power, four main groups trying to vie for power. Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, well, Essenes really don't care, and Zealots, right? Essenes are living off their life up in the mountains there in, in the region of, the, of southern Palestine, writing down the, 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 the scripts and making the, the, the scrolls of the Dead Sea. And then there's the Zealots, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. The Sadducees are corrupt. The only ones that can preserve the purity that Israel needs in order for Messiah to come are the Pharisees. And they believe that if Israel would keep Torah perfectly, Messiah would come. If Israel could keep Shabbat perfectly one time, Messiah would come. There's about 6,000 of them by the time Jesus shows up into the scene. And their main purpose is tied to the fact that they want to avoid the mistakes of past. History past. In the past, Israel went into exile because they compromised. They compromised with the people surrounding them. They compromised with the world. And because they compromised, God said, you're going into exile. And they went into exile. So when they come back from exile, in their minds and in their hearts, they are saying, we will never compromise again. We will never do this again. Because the presence of God has left Jerusalem now. And so now here they are, striving hard because they want the presence of God to come back to Jerusalem. Are you following me? So their motivation is not necessarily off. 
We tend to paint the Pharisees like, you know, I don't want to be a Pharisee because they're not right. And, and, you know, we make songs about it and we're like, all those Pharisees out there. But if you really begin to try to understand the motivation behind this group of people, mainly men, you will understand that they have one purpose and one purpose alone is that Messiah can come to establish his kingdom, that Adonai can return and live with us in Jerusalem, that he can vindicate his people, defeat the occupiers in the land, those pagan occupiers, and once and for all establish the kingdom that he promised to the prophets of old. So you want Gary on your side, kind of, sort of, in a way. Because that's what he's trying to do. Alas, your motivations might be good, but that doesn't mean that your actions are correct. Right? So, I need to ask you a question. First question. Is this, do you agree with this chart? Before we go into the biblical text this morning, do you agree with this chart? Quick show of hands. Yes? How many go up? Yes. If you do bad things, you go to hell. Yes? No? Confused? You don't know? You're scared. Nobody wants to raise their hand because like, oh, no, I, he's going to trick me. He's going to embarrass me. I'm not going to embarrass you. Fine, don't raise your hand. If you do bad things, bad actions, you go to hell. Yes, maybe. What are the bad things? Well, you know, drugs, alcohol, bad music, I don't know, lies, greed, cheating. If you do bad things, you go to hell. We'll take that as a yes. Right? Well, I don't know, and it's okay that I don't know, you know. Some of you might quote Paul and say, well, doesn't Paul say that those who practice these things? Yes, except you, are, you, you, might, be, you might need to read a little before he says that. But for those of you who say yes, because typically I get a yes out of this one. Typically people agree, if you do bad things, you go to hell. If you behave badly, we teach our kids that, right? Or oh, be careful little eyes what you see, or be careful little hands what you do. Why? 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 Why should your hands... Because the what? Is... Well, it's a little bit weird, right? Looking down in love. Uh, Travis, Travis, what are you doing with your little hands? Lisa, Lisa, where are your little feet going? Right? It sounds more like naughty and nice list, right? Yeah. If you agreed with this one and you say yes, then you have to say yes to this one. Because logically, if this is correct, then the opposite also has to be correct. That if you do good things, you go to? If you do bad things, you go to hell. Then that means that if you do good things, you go to? And this is where the majority of you are going to say, well, no, right? Right? Because it's not that simple. It's not that if you, if you go volunteer at the dog shelter, right? If you don't listen to the bad music, you don't watch the bad movies, you go to heaven. So there's something here. Two stories that I would like to sustain this morning before, that, that, that is going to make a very important point in this series. Very important point to understand. Story number one. We read it this morning. It's about the publican and the Pharisee. So let's go to Luke, right? Let's go to Luke chapter uh, 18. Luke chapter 18. Um, and there, Luke chapter uh, 18 is going to tell us this very well-known story of Jesus. Now, we're not, gonna, we're not going to exegete fully the story because there's two stories that I'd like for us to pick, right? But he talks about this parable, and it's very important to understand that the parable is directed to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So he's setting the... Like, Luke is telling us this parable is aimed at somebody specifically. Right? And the somebody specifically is somebody who trusts in themselves. So we're going to name him Gary because it's the Pharisee. And right there, right there in verse 10, it says, um, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One, Gary, a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. We'll call him Matthew for, for practical purposes. And then it says, And the Pharisee stood, prayed with whom? What does it say? Prayed with whom? Prayed with himself. There's something to notice about the prayer of Gary. His prayer is structured like a psalm. Typically, psalms, when you read them, are odes of glory to God for who God is. When Gary prays with himself, he prays as a psalm to how good he is. I thank you, Lord. 
that I am not like other men, extortioners, and terrible liars, cheats. Oh, no, I am not like them. I am not like them. I am faithful. You are lucky to be, I, mm, you are lucky that I'm on your team. That's Gary's prayer. Why I tithe every, everything I have I tithe to the minimum. Right? I fast three times a week. Look at me, look at me. Look at the good things I do for you. Kind of problematic now, isn't it? And here's the, here's, here's the, here's the problem with Gary's prayer. What does it say? George Knight, Sin and Salvation, page 16, for those of you who are curious of, of that reference, I'm quoting him. It says, it's the inadequate view of sin and its effects on human ability. The problem with Gary and Pharisees, and by extension, Pharisaic thinking, is the inadequate view of sin and its effect on human ability. Now, you would say today, well, that's a ridiculous prayer. Who would pray that way? Probably you wouldn't pray that way, but I would probably pause, I, I would submit to you humbly that you might act and speak that way. Well, I definitely don't do what John does. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, he, he smokes. I don't. Right? He watches the things on the internet that I don't. I am better than John. You might present that in your workspace. You might present that to your spouse. Well, you could be married to such and such who beats you. I don't do that. I'm better than. You might not present it to anybody. You might actually rationalize it. I know I have. I know I have. I'm not that bad. I'm not that terrible. My sins are kind of acceptable, you know. So I'm not that bad. I don't lie. I don't cheat. You're not praying. You're not telling God that, but you are telling yourself. And as you tell yourself that, all of a sudden you're putting yourself in a, in a little bit superior category than everybody else. Because you're trying to tell yourself that there's nothing necessarily wrong with you because you're not that bad. You're not like Jim. Ted, or Susie, or Harold, you're not as bad. You haven't done them many bad things. And here's the problem with Pharisaic thinking. Pharisees' tradition said that there was no effect on humanity post-fall. There was no change, basically, for them. So in Pharisaic thinking, humans have a righteous life, can have a righteous life, just like Adam before the fall. Right? They believed that there was some sort of impulse towards evil, and they figured out, well, maybe God put it there. But they figured that you could have a righteous life just like Adam before the fall. You might be catching that there might be a little problem here. right? And this impulse that they talked about could be controlled by the study and meditation of what? Torah. Do you know the difference between Torah and the Word of God? Torah is the first five books of Moses. That's what's called the law. A lot of times we have this really convenient distinction of like the moral law, the civil law. No, no, no. Torah is Torah. Law is law. The five books of Moses are the law. Hardly distinction. Torah is Torah. Okay? So Torah is there so that it helps you control the evil impulse. By meditating, praying, and learning, and studying Torah, you can control the impulse. But we all agree that it is very difficult to do. Right? Very little people have succeeded at this. So, they believed in repentance, they believed in restitution, they believed in forgiveness, and they believed that the strenuous endeavor to accomplish the law are the marks of a righteous man. George Eldon Law, once again, in, it quoted by, by, by George Knight in, in Sin and Salvation. So, the strenuous endeavor, what is it, what, what again? The what? Strenuous endeavor to live a righteous life, to accomplish the Torah, is the marking of a righteous man. You following so far? Right? Because they did believe, believe in, 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 in forgiveness. They believed in restitution. They believed in, in, in grace. It's not, here's the thing. A lot of times we look at Pharisees and say, well, they were legalists. Ah. Look at the broader picture. They did believe in grace. They believed in forgiveness. They believed in repentance. They believed in restitution. They just thought that you needed to be protected from breaking the law. 
because it all had to do with purity, because it all had to do with if we could get our act together, Messiah will come. And if Messiah comes, the Romans go. You follow so far, right? That's why they had 1,521 Shabbat laws. My goodness, 1,521 Shabbat laws. Over 800 daily laws, 365 no laws. That's for every day of the year, there's a no. They believe in forgiveness, like I said, and grace, and somehow the obedience of the law has to be very central to the role of life. So depending on the school of thought that they had, you could either do, if you, good do, de- if you, do, if you do good deeds, you go to, if you do bad deeds, you go to, Gehenna, hell. And here's where grace comes in. Let's say at the end of your life, there is a balance, and we're equal. There is equally good, and equally bad. Where do you go? Ah, Adonai steps in and grace tips the scales in your favor. He will look at your life. And if there was a strenuous endeavor to keep the law, he'll say, principal parent, well done, son. Way to trudge through that mud. Let's tip the scales in your favor. You get it? Good, paradise, bad, Gehenna, equal, grace. So I thank you that I'm not like all these other men. And then there's the tax collector, the publicanos. The publicanos is somebody who is hired by Rome to get taxes from his own people. He is despised by his employers, and he is despised by his family. Do you understand what a publican went through? He's just a tax collector. I mean, anybody know an IRS worker here? <laughs> you probably wouldn't be ashamed of him and like despise the guy, but this is the life of a publicanos, a publican. He's despised by his employers. He's despised by his family. And this man is in the temple. He is far off in a corner. He wouldn't even lift up his eyes and he would say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Right? And Jesus says, these two, this man, went down to his house. How? How did that man go? Justified. Justified. He goes down to his house justified. It's not the first one. Because the problem of the first one is that you... if. Here's the problem. Here's the problem that we need to understand, and, and, and I'm going to hammer it home. It, viewing sin and righteousness is a series of actions instead of a condition of the heart that stems from the lack of a relational reality and gospel. Do you understand? Sin is not a series of actions. And righteousness is not a series of actions. And as much as we look at the Pharisees today and we're like, well, that's illogical, that's exactly, I would humbly present to you, how we behave. It's exactly how we live our life. It's exactly how we live and comport ourselves within our religious tradition. We have made the mistake of the Pharisee of dwindling down sin to a series of actions instead of a condition of the heart that stems from the lack of a relational reality in gospel. Do you have proof of this? Well, yeah. First of all, P.T. Forsythe that said that there is no sin more subtle than the sin of goodness. You know? The one that we, we probably do sometimes. You know, when you're sharing tea with your friends, I'm not talking about the beverage. You got some tea? Oh, I got some tea. Mm. Well, we're not that bad, are we, Lisa? No. <laughs> mm. Hey, how you doing, Johnny? Oh, Johnny. Mm-mm-mm. You're not praying in the temple. You're just living it out in life. And you've positioned yourself because you don't do the things that Johnny does in a higher pedestal than Johnny. The sin of goodness is a problem. Yeah? Story number two will kind of hammer this point home. Story number two is Jesus 
and the rich young ruler. Let's go. Luke chapter 19. One, again, Luke chapter 18. And here's the thing about Luke chapter 18. Um, Luke chapter 18 starts with these two parables. The first parable is about this unjust judge, right, or the persistent widow. And a lot of times we think, well, so the lesson here is that, that we should be persistent. No, no, no. The lesson of that one is that if this judge will listen to a persistent widow, how much more your Father in heaven will listen to you. And therefore comes the second story of the Pharisee and the publican who gets heard and justified by whom? The Father, just for the small prayer that he prayed. Are you following so far? Right? So now there's two stories, and now there's going to be an actual account of a story. And we know this story very well. Here comes this rich young ruler who is probably of the Pharisaic tribe or of the Pharisaic uh, lenience, uh, Adherence, adherence is the word I was looking for. And he asks, the, asks a question to Jesus. What does he ask him? What must I? To inherit eternal life. Yes, right there. Luke chapter 18, I'm in verses 18 all the way to 23. What must I do to inherit life? And Jesus said, well, keep the commandments. Logical, yes? Well, which ones? Well, well you know, the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal. Verse 20, 18, 20, if you want to read with me. Don't commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And, and he says in verse 21, the rich young ruler says, well, uh, check, 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 check. Done that since, uh, since my youth. Ah, Jesus says. So lest you think that the answer that Jesus is giving to what shall I do in order to inherit eternal life is keep the commandments, you might be missing what exactly is the answer. One thing you're missing. Go and sell, right? Give away, come follow me. Unless you think that Jesus is telling him to do that specifically, Jesus is telling him there's one thing you're missing from all the behavior you're presenting. And here's the question. The question is born out of a problem. And the problem is this, my friends. When you quantify your righteousness, you can never be sure if you have enough. If you're going to live a life that at the end of it all is going to stand before the throne of God and you are hoping that he will look at the balances of your life and you, he will see more righteous deeds than evil deeds, then you are never sure that you will actually have enough righteousness. Are you following me? You will never be sure that you did enough. Did I do enough? I could have done more. The regrets of I could have done more. It's, um, I'm, I'm reminded right now of that scene in Schindler's List. Have you guys seen Schindler's List? Again, not endorsing, just if you've seen it, at the end where the guy is looking at this pin, right? After he's going away because everything, you know, he's looking at this pin, this lousy pin, and he says, I could have saved 10 more, right? He looks at his car, I could have saved more. If you're going to quantify evil and sin in your life and you're going to quantify righteousness at the end of your life, you will never be sure if you had enough. And that is the problem of this rich young ruler. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, keep the commandments. Done it. What else? Surely there's more. One thing you're missing. You need to rearrange your priorities. Remember that we said that your behavior, and your, your behavior and your values need to line up. And when they do, you go crazy. Remember we, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago? Yeah? That's what Jesus is telling this man. Sell, distribute, follow. It, this, this, this answer, my friends, exposes and erodes the shaky foundation of performative righteousness. Of you doing the things because, well, you got to do them, right? Check, 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 check. I don't do, I don't eat, I don't dress, I don't listen. And again, all good stuff. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Good stuff, yeah, sure. But why are you doing it? And how are you going to present it? One thing has to do with the one, the, the, this one thing he has to do, only the one can do for him. And, and here's, where, here, here's where the question, then who can be saved, right? They said, well, <laughs> who can be saved? 
And what does God answer? What does Jesus answer? Things that are impossible with men are possible with God. And here's why we tell it. Just follow a couple of verses later and go into Luke 19, and you are going to find the experience of a wee little man, a wee little man was he, he climbed upon the for what? Lord, he wanted to see. Zacchaeus, you come down. What does Zacchaeus does when Jesus goes into his house? He's going to give half of his stuff away, and he's going to return four times the amount he's defrauded to people. Did Jesus ask him to do that? Where in the text does it say that Jesus asked him to sit? No. He does it. Why? Because he believed. And how do I know he believed? Because Jesus says so. Salvation has come to this house. Do you realize the difference? Here's a rich young ruler just a couple of chapters before who cannot do what Jesus is asking him because he has too much stuff. He has his life completely in disarray and his priorities are off. And here's this other man who goes in the covertness of hiding behind the multitude, climbing upon a tree, and as Jesus stops under the tree and says, I'm going to your house... And he goes into his house. This man, without any prompting, does exactly what Jesus asked this other man. And Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. Why? Because righteousness is not a performative action. And because you cannot quantify sin. And of all the sins, my friends, pride and self-sufficiency is the most hopeless and the most incurable. Me? Proud? No. I'm super humble. (sighs) I knew a man like that. I would look at him in the mirror every day. Sometimes he raises his ugly face once in a while. What is the point of living a righteous life, right, if nobody knows about it? (laughs) Right? The only thing more important about being humble is to look humble. Right? What's the point of living a righteous life if nobody knows about it? Preacher? Well, salvation is not about a quantity or a quality of sins. It's not about a quota of righteousness. You can't manage your life by bookkeeping your behavior. You will go crazy. If you start bookkeeping your behavior, you will go crazy. Well, I guess I behaved wrong this way. I got to go do something good, right? Well, I listened to the bad thing. Well, I got to go to the homeless shelter now and serve. Well, I did this. Well, now I, oh, this this one values, this one is worth three good works. So I, I, you know, right? Like, seriously. Well, I broke this commandment. Well, then I got to do like four times to restitute for this. And on and on and on your life goes. And at the end of your life you're wondering, am I saved or am I not saved? Will I make it or will I not make it? Oh, by God's grace, I'll just stretch for them. Oh, but there I go, grace, preacher. Oh, I'll just get some grace in me. Oh, by God's grace, there I go. My friends, when religion becomes perverted to be a means of mere comfort and dense satisfaction, it becomes an integument so tough that even the grace of God cannot get through it. When you begin to bookkeep your life this way, it is so tough that not even the grace of God can get through it. Because let me tell you something, the unconverted mind, the ungospeled life, though well behaved, is still lost. You follow. And you and I can be lost sitting in the pews of the church. Older brother syndrome, anybody? You can be lost sitting in the pews of the church. I know I was. I spent 30 years, almost 20 as a pastor, living my life bookkeeping since. Praise God for those of you who, who have never had that experience. I'm happy that you've been living in freedom. But for those of you who have not and are hearing something and feeling a little discomfort, maybe, just maybe... Don't hate the messenger. Because sin is not an amount. Righteousness is not a quota. Salvation is not bookkeeping while believing in Jesus' backup. You know? One day I'll make it by God's grace. 
And when I get to the pearly gates, hopefully he tips the scales in my favor. You know? Oh, there I go by grace, preacher. There I go by grace. Grace is the power of God to help you live a godly life. That's what grace is. It's not this dispensation you get at the end of your life and tips the scales in your favor by looking at, oh, well, the good things and the bad things. Because see, here's the thing, friends. Jesus didn't die so that you could try harder and maybe succeed. He died so that you could die and live free. Amen. It's not about you, oh, I've got to try harder. I've got to try harder. Every time, I, I, I just, I find this idea of interesting of how, like, oh, Christian, it's so hard to be a Christian preacher. It's so hard. It's so hard. Yeah, well, I... Sure, it's hardships. I'm not saying it's easy peasy breezy. Storms do come to both the man who built his house on the rock and the man who built his house on the sand. True. But he didn't live. He didn't die so that you could try harder. He died so that you could die. Be born again and live free. So where are we at? Where are we at, folks? Where are we at? When you and I can enter into the reality of salvation, the reality of freedom, we won't be asking the question, what must I do? You won't worry. You know why? Because you understand that he did it. You don't worry if you've done enough or too little. Or sin too much? Fact is, my friends, you cannot behave yourself into salvation. And again, this is for those of us who might have our act together. Pristine lives, pristine families, super involved in the church, very giving. But only you and him know where your heart is. You're mostly tense and scared that you're one bad decision away from breaking that pristine and good image you have. One bad move away from losing it all. And you forget that he has already done the work and shown you how to live. So I present to you today humbly, don't struggle asking the question, am I saved? Or what is worse, I am saved so how do I keep pure and not lose it? If you have accepted, believed, been born again, then you don't have to live like Gary. You get to live like Jesus. If you've accepted, believed, received, been born again, you don't have to live like Gary. You get to live like Jesus. Jesus. With the spirit of the living God who brought him from the dead. Living in you. Amen. Receive it. Believe it. Walk it out. Receive it. Believe it. Walk it out. In Jesus' name.